come now to the second in our series of studies of the life of Elisha. And unfortunately, we have to skip over much material because we only have five sessions to consider a whole lifetime. And uh, Elisha is a prophet who has so many interesting, fascinating, marvelous things happen to him at which he is right in the center. It's impossible to consider them all. And so we have to jump. We're going to jump over that event when he goes with Elijah, his master. They cross over the Jordan and Elijah asks him, what would you have me do for you before I am taken from you? And he asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit, the spirit that was on Elijah. And he says, well, it's a difficult thing, but if you see me when I am taken from you, it will be given to you. In other words, he cast the answer to the prayer not on himself, but on, on the Lord. If you see me, if God allows that, then he'll give you what you ask. And we know that he saw the chariots of fire come and sweep Elijah up into the heavens and the mantle behind. And a double portion indeed of Elijah's spirit was on Elisha. And he smote the river and the waters divided and he crossed over on dry ground. And well, we have to skip that story. We have to skip the incident of the purification of the waters of Jericho. Uh, they, they were dying from the impure waters and they were made pure and clean by Elisha. We have to skip over the incident of the axe head, which is actually on our uh, pamphlets and you see the axe coming out of the water. Well, we have to skip over that because we don't have time to do everything. We have to skip over the incident of the she-bears and the teenage boys who call to e Elisha, go up you bald head. And they were not just little tykes, they were teenagers. Uh, the word that was used there is very broad, but they were obviously not just little ones. Well, you have to skip over that. You say, I to hear that one. Well, maybe we'll get to that on the Lord's Day in uh, uh, Berean Bible Church. I'm not sure what we'll do there, but we're, we're going to continue a couple more snippets of Elisha uh, even on the next Lord's Day. So don't despair. We'll see what we get there. We're going to this morning to the passage that was read in your hearing about the widow with her cruise of oil. And we read the passage already, so we don't need to read it again, but we're going to break it down into these three divisions and then followed by some personal applications. And the three divisions are these. Widow's affliction. We're going to consider, first of all, the condition of this poor widow. Secondly, the prophet's direction. What does he tell her to do? And then thirdly, we're going to consider the Lord's provision. So affliction, direction, provision, and then application. So they're all shuns. Affliction, direction, provision, and application. Let's start then with the widow's affliction. Now, we looked at the, her plea to the prophet, turning back again to 2 Kings chapter 4. Open your Bibles with me. We're going to be looking at this and turning to some few other passages to shed light on uh, this event. But we see it in her plea. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. And the creditor has come to take my two sons to be his servants or slaves. So, when we think about her condition, it's really pitiable. It's an affliction. And then first of all is the affliction of widowhood. And she tells the tale in just so few words, but there's so much picked into those few words. Your servant. She looks up to Elisha as the head of the sons of the prophets. Your servant, my husband, is dead. Widowhood. Now it doesn't say in the text how long they had been long enough to have two sons who were evidently again probably teenagers because they were going to be taken as servants, as slaves uh, in payment for the debt of the family. Widowhood. They'd been married, let's say, some 15, 20 years. 20 years of life. 
shared 20 years of a partnership, 20 years of having someone always there at your side, always someone there to bring your burdens to, someone leading you, someone guiding you, someone caring for you, someone providing for you. And yet, now he's gone. The numbness, the, the empty nights, going to bed alone after having a companion, a partner in life. And, and for those of us who are married and have a loving and, and a godly home, it's almost unimaginable. And for those who may be widowed, you know where this woman is in her pain and sorrow. But it, there's something added to that. Added to the pain and sorrow and heartbreak of widowhood is now the humility of poverty. You see, they have come in their situation into debt. She says the creditor has come. That means they are in debt. They owe money to some lender of some nature. Uh, they didn't have banks as we know. But they did have those who lent money to others and she and her husband come into some condition of poverty now there's no way we can understand that he's a son of the prophets that means he's like you might consider a reformed baptist pastor uh, reformed baptist pastors in small churches are not known for their overflowing abundance of this world's goods uh, there is not a, a great supply of money. We don't see Reformed Baptist pastors flying first class and saying, I'm the king's son and the king's son should have to go economy class, as some of these uh, televangelists and uh, so-called preachers do, gospel proponents. That's not our case. That wasn't the case of this son of the prophets. No, it seems that in in honesty and in uh, integrity he had borrowed money perhaps it was to have a sideline or a little business so that his wife and a worker at home could manage it and and perhaps he of course pitching in that they would have income supplementary to whatever he received as a prophet and they had done this in all good faith and then he passed away perhaps smitten by jezebel or perhaps passed away through some disease uh, in life expectancy was not great in those days. And now she's left a widow with this debt. And widows didn't have great means of income. If the prophet was poor, now she's a widow. And all the more poverty is going to leave her in its depths. The business failed. The debt is still there. And they're righteous people. And we know from the scriptures that the righteous man borrows, or the righteous man, the wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous man is gracious. And she didn't even have enough to pay back what they had in integrity borrowed for a good cause. The humility. Righteous people in debt. Without means to pay ever been in that condition you know it is humiliating it is horrifying and you're looking for the light at the end of the tunnel and you don't see it and there she was and the only thing left was that now the creditor was going to come and take her only possession that would have any worth what was that her two young sons teenage most likely her two sons we're going to be taken into bondage. And the word used allows that, the word used to describe them, and the narrative obviously shows that they had economic, which would not be true of toddlers or even boy, small boys. These are teenage boys able to work. They had economic value. The Old Testament, you see, allowed this. Let's turn back to Leviticus chapter 25. Maybe you think, this is horrible. How could this be in Israel that Israeli, the Jewish boys... It would be the slavery or, or bondage, bond servants. Look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 39 to 41. If we want to get a little background as to how this could happen, Leviticus 25, 39 describes the situation. 
And if a countryman of yours be so poor with regard to you, that he sells himself to you, you shall not subject him to a slave's service. He shall be with you as a hired man, as if he were a sojourner. He shall serve with you until the year of Jubilee. He shall then go out from you, he and his sons with him, and shall go back to his family, to return to the property of his forefathers. So this was all that was left. Her sons are going to be taken as bond servants in this bondage of, as it were, serfdom until the year of Jubilee. So there is an out at least. There's the year of Jubilee, but maybe it had just got to go 49 more years. And the widow is thinking to herself, 49 years, my sons are going to be, oh my, they're not going to be young anymore. And I'm not going to be young anymore. And I'll miss their growing up years and their grandchildren. And again, torment upon them. The only way out. Is that the only way out? No, it's not. Because in the heartbreak of widowhood, the humility of poverty, and the horror of expectancy, the widow turns to the prophet of Jehovah. In other words, she turns to God. She looks to him. She cries out to Elisha. She doesn't curse God and die, as it was the counsel of Mishob. She doesn't go to the Baals and say, Oh, Baal, hear us, and cut herself, as would have been the counsel of the prophets of Baal. She doesn't go drown her sorrows in drink or drugs and say, I just want to forget it all. She doesn't have a party and go and in a cycle of despair, spiraling downwards and closing in on herself and say, oh, I'm just going to be here by myself and I might as well just die like Jonah sitting under his gourd plant. What she does is go off it of the true and living God. Crying to Elisha is crying to God because she knows that Elisha, as a recipient of special revelation, as an instrument of God in this day in, Eli in Israel, she knows Elisha has the ear of God. Elisha is, as it were, her mediator to bring her to God. She goes to God. Now, isn't that a lesson for us? Where do you run in your times of trial? Where do you run in desperation? Oh, I'm going to go to my friends and they'll gather around me and hug me and give, give me a pity party and uh, we'll all just cry together. And, or do you run to the bottle or do you run to uh, other solutions, man-made methods? Or do you run first to your closet? Now, you see, we have a... Much better than Elisha. As Jesus himself might have said, Behold, a greater than Elisha is here. And who is the greater one than Elisha? It is Jesus, our sympathetic high priest. Yes, prophet. Who is our prophet, priest, and king? It is Jesus. And how is he described to us in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4? We, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, the writer says. We're unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.16, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, there's something for all of us here. She runs to her mediator, Elisha, who has the ear of God. We can run to our mediator, who is God himself. Jesus, our great high priest. Great Jesus, our prophet. Jesus, our sympathetic Savior. Jesus and kind to all who call upon him. Well, there's the widow's plight, her affliction. Secondly, let's consider the, uh, the prophet's direction. What does he tell her to do? Going back to 2 Kings 4. And Elisha said to her, verse 2, 
What's for you? Now, how would you read that? As you look in the Hebrew, it's, it's just three words in, uh, in Hebrew. What shall I do for you? What shall I do for you? Perhaps this prophet, and, and I, I think this would be the, the case, if someone runs to me in a time of need and says, you've got to help me. Don't we feel so inadequate? What can I do for you? What do you want me to do? Who am I? And remember, Elisha is a shot prophet. What was the first training that he received as he was there at the feet of Elijah? Pour water on my hands. <laughs> You're the big shot prophet man. No, he wasn't the big shot prophet man. He was a lowly servant. What do you want me to do for you? Who am I? I'm just, I'm a prophet, yes. But I'm just the servant of the Lord. What do you want me to do? And I think he's pointing her eyes away from himself to his great master, the Lord Jehovah. And so he goes on though from there and he says, tell me, what do you have in the house? What have you got? And that's a wise question, by the way, when anyone comes to you in financial straits and says, well, no, I've got, I've got financial problems. They're, they're, uh, I've got to pay this debt. And, uh, and yet you go in their house and you know, they've got a 65-inch uh, TV on the wall and they've got a, a closet full of uh, the latest... Uh, fashion designer clothes and they've got uh, all of this uh, very, very fancy electronic equipment over here in the cupboard and they have to have the Apple 5e uh, phone and it's iPhone and you say what, what do you got in the house and I'm not sure that was exactly the point of Eli Elisha's question but it's a good question what means do you have to meet this end? Are we going to just expect the heavens to open? Are we going to turn our umbrellas upside down as one preacher in Manila told the people to do and God's going to pour out blessings, but of course you have to give to me first. We beg God to put anything in your umbrella. Uh, well, is that what the prophet is saying? What he's got in the house, you know? Uh, he wants to know, is there any means that we have before you just expect God to dump something from heaven? What means do you have at your disposal to pay this? And so, it's wrong for us, in a sense, to, to look to God to bail us out if, if we haven't really plumbed the depths of what He's already given us. So, He asks, what have you got in the house? And so she, she answers, her maidservant, again in a humble way, has nothing in the house, except a jar, my version puts it, a flask, I believe is the King James or the ASV, that's a good, perhaps even a better word, a flask, you see, is not a big container. A flask of oil, a jar, a small container. Now, I don't know, I haven't been to the grocery store here in Australia, but uh, in, in the Philippines we have what we call a sorry, sorry store on every corner. And you can go there, it's just a little neighborhood store, even less than a 7-Eleven. And what they sell there are endless little containers of everything. You can buy one clove of garlic in a Sorry Sorry store. You can buy one stick of gum, and you can buy one cigarette at a time. You don't buy the pack, you see. Now, I'm not, by the way, promoting cigarette smoking, but just as an illustration. Uh, well... This widow he had, again, the small size, not the large economy size that you go to the, the big warehouse store and you get, you know, a, a box of 500 toilet rolls, toilet uh, rolls of toilet tissue. And No, no, this is just the minimum size. A flask of cooking oil. So, <laughs> you know, you shake your head and say, oh, we're not going to get much out of that. This is not going to pay off the debt. She couldn't afford the large size, of course. All that was left, not even a handful of flour, 
with just a little bit of oil. So here's the direction. And he says, all right, here's the prophet's direction to her. Go, borrow at large for yourselves, borrow from around the neighborhood, from all your neighbors, empty vessels, not a few. Empty vessels. Now here the word vessel is just the more generic term for any container. But obviously he's saying not a few. Get the biggest ones and the most number of empty vessels that you can find in the neighborhood. You can just imagine, okay, so our two sons are sent out. They go out the door, see, knock on doors in the neighborhood. Hey, can we, do you have any empty containers? Oh, we got uh, this uh, jug of, uh, uh, well, we had some drinking water from the little local store here. Yeah, you can have that one and you go next door. Well, we got this cooking pot. There's nothing in it. Okay. Oh, well, we have a, a vat like this. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, can we borrow it? And so whatever vessels, whatever container and gets one of those uh, water storage containers this big and he, he, whatever they can find in the neighborhood when they drag it, carry it, bring it, however they get it and they bring it over to uh, the house, but that, that's what the direction was. But then the second thing is, go shut the door behind you. Get all those vessels in the house, and then shut the door. Why shut the door? You ever wonder that? I, I think it's like this. Maybe the neighbors see this going on. I don't know how it would be in your neighborhood where maybe the houses are a little further apart, but it, uh, if, if I can think of this uh, in more of a little bit congested city setting, you can see the neighbors looking out their windows and here are these two boys, these teenage boys, and they're getting all these empty containers and they're bringing them in the house. What are they going to do with them? What's going on over there? And maybe they're peeking in. Maybe they're following the boys. What, what, what's this? Like, what kind of game are they running here? And close the door. Lock the door behind you and your sons. Get away from their prying eyes and just start pouring into these vessels from your flask of oil. And then when the vessel's full, set it aside, get the next one. There's the direction, okay? So this is what you're going to do. Now, he doesn't say why. He doesn't say the end result. He doesn't say what he's aiming at. He says, just do it. The third part of the tale is the Lord's provision. The Lord's provision. And the woman obeys. Verse 5. She obeyed immediately. No question. She, what am I going to do with that? She says her boys, okay, they go out, they borrow the vessels, they bring them in, and they shut the door behind her and her sons, and she starts to pour. Now, think of this, okay, we're 21st century. We... Most of you were probably educated in a, not postmodern, but probably a modernistic educational system which denies all, all hope of anything supernatural. Miracles just don't happen, right? I mean, that's what I was taught. We have the scientific method. We have cause and effect. And cause is when you pour out something, it's empty, right? That's the effect. Well, she didn't have this uh, post, uh, th this modernistic, uh, secular humanist training that says there's nothing supernatural. The prophet said, pour into the vessels, and when that one's full, you take it away and get the next one. And so she starts pouring. And you, know, you would think, okay, you've got to keep tilting it to get more out, right? She didn't have to keep tilting. It just comes and comes. And so one vessel is filled. And, you know, maybe she lines them up. Maybe she started with the smaller ones up to the bigger ones. And that one, get the next one. So the sun, you know, puts it in place. She pours. The level comes up. Next one. And pours. And the next one. And it's bigger. And pours. And the next one. And pours. And these vessels are getting filled. I said, give me the next Mom, no more! And whoop, it stops. And she now has a house filled with vessels full of oil.
Well, what do I do now? He tells her, okay, next thing, take the oil to the market. Now, empty vessels, <laughs> all right, relatively easy to carry. Let me carry that for you. Oh, no problem. Uh, now, full vessels, starting, you know, various sizes, all the sizes that they could get from the neighbors. And so they begin to lug these down to the local market, to the uh, seller of oil. What do you got? Got some oil. Well, let me see your oil. So, well, where'd you get this oil? It's good stuff. No, why do I say that? Well, you think of Jesus with the wine of Cana, turning water into wine. What kind of wine did he come, come out with? Remember, the servant says, uh, usually, you know, they get wine at first and save the bad stuff for when people aren't so sensitive to taste. But you got the best wine. Last. And here I suspect this wine that came out of that cruise is grade A, top quality, best you can buy price. I'll buy all you can get. He pays her. Now, what does she do with the money? Elisha tells her, go, pay that creditor, and live off the rest. More than enough to pay her debt. Now she has enough to live on for the next time period, maybe till her sons graduate from college. <laughs> what a provision! Gracious provision. And I just pictured the scene again. I mean, you, you, when you use what I would call sanctified imagination. It makes this so much more vivid. Just imagine the widow now going to the creditor. And maybe he's thinking, ah, oh, here comes this widow again. She's going to beg me for more time. I'm, I'm tired of this widow. I, say, I told you already, your sons are going today. Mm. Sir, how much do I owe you again? 473 shekels and two drachmas. 473 shekels and two drachmas. Where'd you get that? The Lord will provide. She walks out with her two sun arm, smile from ear to ear. Now, that's the story. That's what happened. What are the lessons that God has for us? Well, there are a multitude of lessons, as you can well imagine. And the first lesson is a little more on the painful side, but it's a lesson we need to learn as well. And that is this, that sometimes, in fact often, God allows us to come to an extremity of need. Even His own beloved people why? To teach us not to trust in ourselves, but in Him. Not to find our sufficiency in our brains, in our bounds, in our abilities, in our friends. To find our all in Him. Where do we turn? Problems at home. Whether it's illness, whether it's loved ones, whether it's children who are causing heartbreak, financial problems, which do afflict even wealthy countries. Australia is not like the Philippines in terms of uh, available, disposable income, but still financial troubles come to us at home. Where do we turn? We use means. God uses means, yes. But where is our hope? Problems at work or lack of work. This happens time and you're out the door. It doesn't make a pleasant working situation. Problems at work. Problems at church. People leave. People say terrible things. 
We come to our extremity. We feel at the end of our rope. Persecution. Spiritual struggle. Sin seems to have so much power. Temptation is hard. I, 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 can, I can't take anymore. God allows us to come to our extremities to teach us His sufficiency. Where will we find strength? Where will we find grace in time of need? Fightings without, fears within, abandonment, separation, trials. What is the pattern we see in Scripture? Well, I think we see this pattern again and again. You've got all right, the, the Israelites coming out of Egypt. We've been delivered. We're free. Wait a minute. What's the cloud of dust coming from over there? We just came from there. What's the cloud of dust we see? It's the Egyptians with their chariots and their army. Wait a minute. Moses, we're trapped. There's the Red Sea. We go, we can't get away. Stand still and see the salvation of your God. Moses raises his staff, the waters part. They go through on dry land. And the Egyptians are following! The waters cover the Egyptians. God says, that Egyptian army that you see today, you won't see them again. Extremity! How about New Testament? Second Corinthians, we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. You feel like that? Paul did. Second Corinthians eight, one eight. Despaired even of life. What is he going to say? Indeed. We had the sentence of death within ourselves. <laughs> sentence of death? It's like, it's all over, man. Forget about it. No hope anywhere. No hope anywhere? That's not what he says. In order that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death, and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope. So, something God does for our good. Brethren, maybe you're there. Maybe you're feeling, I I'm at the end of my rope. Where do I go from here? Despairing of life. Sentence of death. That was the widow, you see. Extremity. Where are you going to put your trust? We sang earlier, there in the power of Christ, I stand. In the death of Christ, I live. We look to Christ, our great high priest. Second thing, second lesson is this, that God meets our needs, although not in the way we might expect. God meets our needs but not necessarily the way we are expecting him to work, or even perhaps the direction that we ask him to do for us. The widow may have expected Elisha to pray that God would move the heart of the creditor to be uh, compassionate and to give her more time. Maybe she would expect Elisha to go to some of his sort of a little more money and to uh, draw on their kindness and to say, well, we collected an offering for you, ma'am, and here is enough money to bail your sons out of this problem. Um, but God had another way. And that's something we need to learn. We should not dictate to God how He is going to meet our need. God, this is what you've got to do to get me out of this problem. God, I want you uh, to give me a wife so I don't have a problem with pornography anymore. Forget about it. 
That's generally not God's way. You get over that problem first. <laughs> Don't dictate. This is an illustration of this, and uh, I may have mentioned this in the, the sermons on Elijah, but there was a widow. Prumacher in his, his uh, book on the life of Elijah tells this story, that there was a widow who uh, was in a cottage praying for bread. And maybe I said this five years ago. I don't remember, so you probably don't either. But anyway, she's in her cottage. She, was, she had nothing in the cupboard, praying that God would supply her need. And there were kids passing by the cottage who heard the widow praying. And they said, ah, we're going to play a trick on this lady. Let's go to the store and get some bread. And so they went to the store, bought some bread, and they left it in a sack on the door of the widow, knocked on the door, and went and hid behind the bushes. And the widow came to the door. Door, There's a sack. She looked in the sack. There's bread! And she thanked God. Thank you, Lord, for answering my prayer and sending me this bread. And the boys came out from behind the bushes and said, How was it God who gave you that bread? We put that bread there. And she said, Ah, God used you to me bread. Praise God. See, don't dictate to God how he's going to do it. He may have another trick up his sleeve that you didn't even imagine he was going to do. All right, there's the second lesson. Third lesson. Third lesson is this, just simply, that he's able and willing to meet our needs out of his exhaustless supply. And so, we come and we bring our empty flasks, our empty vessels. And we put in God's hand what, what means we may have. We put in his hands all of our sorrows, our heartaches. Can God fill these needs? Can he fill the empty vessels? We, am I spiritualizing the passage and saying, well, what God did for the widow, he can do for you? We have Philippians 4.19. Clear and plain. My God. The Apostle Paul says, My God, who is our God, shall supply every need of yours, not every wish, not every want, not every desire, every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's a problem. Now, it doesn't say how he's going to do it. And certainly, again, it's not every wish, desire, longing, request. Every need. And we know from the scriptures that even these events were written for our instruction. What's the instruction? God is able and willing to meet your genuine needs. He met the widow's needs. She sought God through the prophet. He met George Mueller's needs. You read the biography of George Mueller, the man with the, the orphanages. And how often was it, you know, they're down to their last pence and they have to buy the, however many orphans. And they have a debt to bear. They have an obligation to meet and then somebody knocks on the door. Or maybe there's something that was delayed in the mail, a, a check or a, a gift of money. And it arrives just in time. Many times you read that in George Mueller's biography. Why? What did he do? He cried to God. God answered and met his needs. Look to him, not to the problem. Look to him, not to the ways. Look to the cross. Can you be guaranteed what's, what? that God's going to supply my every need? He gave His only begotten Son. He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how will He not with Him freely give us all things? Physical needs? I'm not saying He's going to make you rich. But God... Here's the cries of his people. Spiritual needs, fighting temptation, your temper, 
You know, in my years of pastoral ministry, some member would come to me with a problem, a struggle with sin. My first question, brother, are you praying about this daily? Are you seeking God every day to help you to conquer that temptation? You know what the answer was invariably? No. Where are you trusting? Is it willpower? Is it what we read on the signs around this camp? The answer lies. No. What do you see within you? Emptiness, pain, suffering, sin. The answer lies within Christ. And that's what we learn from Elisha and the widow and the cruise of oil. God is willing and able. Take your vessel. Put your empty vessel before Christ. Fill me, Lord. This is an empty vessel. God loves to do that. Why? He pours the this of the glory from Himself into us. So that when people see us, and, and maybe we have conquered a sin, and we have grown in grace, and then, wow, what did you do? And we say, it wasn't me, I'm an empty vessel. That's God's glory. That's God's work. Not me. God gets all the glory. Take your empty vessel. Bring them to Christ. Not a few. Bring them all. Let him fill them. Next lesson is that we bring our vessels in believing. Again, it teaches, as I, I kind of got ahead of myself with my last statement, but that question I asked to those members, have you been praying? Brethren, how do we bring our vessels to God? The means we have? Prayer. Believing prayer. If you're not bringing those, they won't be filled. If you're not seeking the face of Christ, you can't expect that He will answer. Don't be a secular humanist. I've been teaching a class in high school on world views. And as I went through this, I, I learned a lot teaching high school, by the way. Uh, if you want to try to teach it. But secular humanism was the, was the whole ethos that my generation imbibed. Now, I don't know about you young people, if that's still what you get, and probably more in your sciences, that, you know, trial or we, we do this with the test tubes and we see how it works, and it's all cause-effect. And we can understand the world around us just by the scientific method. Well, that's secular humanism. Don't be a secular humanist when we come to the God of the Bible. There is a supernatural. There is a God in heaven. And the God in heaven hears our... And you remember Daniel going back to our uh, series the first time I came here. And Daniel's brought before the king to interpret his dreams. And the king says, Daniel, I hear that you can interpret dreams. And he says, not me, but there's a God in heaven. I love that line. It's one of my favorite in the whole life of Daniel. There's a God in heaven. Don't be a secular humanist, or what the Puritans used to call a practical atheist. There's a God in heaven, and He's our God. And my God shall supply all your needs. Go to Him in believing prayer. Prayer meetings are so vital in churches, and it's a sign of the times that we have churches with hundreds of members, mega churches, and no prayer meetings. Looking to means, looking to sound systems, looking to polished speakers who have their hair in the right place with hair. <laughs> and it's not us. We're not trusting in means. Our God is in the heaven. Our confidence and our hope are in Him. Go to Him in believing prayer. Lastly, dear friends, what a comfort to know the God who holds all in, the, the, in His hand in the time of a crisis. You know, Marx again, I mentioned earlier last night, uh, said that uh, the gospel, Christianity, religion is just a crutch for the feeble-minded. 
Well, that's rubbish. It's really rubbish. Because in essence, you know, we're all needy people. It's not a crutch for us. It's just reality. Because God holds all things in His hand. We serve the King of Kings. He's our God. He's not just some force. He's our Savior. Our great high priest. Our prophet. Our King. He's a benevolent King and Master. And yes, Christians come into desperate dances. Dear friends, don't ever believe the lie of the prosperity gospel preachers. You know, you come and be a Christian, you'll be wealthy, you'll be healthy, and the sun will shine every day. It's not true. And we see it here with this widow. Christians come into desperate circumstances. But you know, those desperate circumstances wear a smiling face. Every dark cloud has a silver lining for a Christian. Maybe every silver lining has a dark cloud too. But that only that dark cloud is to be the backdrop for the silver lining. And the silver lining is this. There's a God in heaven. He's my God. And He's going to care for me. He does care for me. And I can go to Him. And He hears my cry. Where do you go? The bottle? Your bank account? Your friends? <laughs> the best of men is a man at best. All means, earthly means fail. Dear friend, you need this God. You need a Savior. What will you do in the last day? What will you do in the hour of death? And it's a reality. Eternity. Eternity. What will you do in eternity? But if you know this God is my God, my God will supply all my needs. I need a Savior. I need forgiveness. My God supplied that in His the Lord Jesus. Dear friend, come to Him. What hinders you? What holds you back? Selfish pride? Stop on it. Not worth it. Know yourself for what you are. You need a Savior. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you that we can come to you for you are tender and kind to all who fear your name. You are gracious to those who are lowly. You hear the cry of those who are contrite in heart. We come to you as such. We come to you as needy people. We needy sinners. We thank you that there is provision for all our needs according to your riches and glory. We pray for your people who are undergoing various trials at this time. Whether it's financial, whether it's personal, whether it's spiritual, whether it's family, whether it's work, whether even in the church. We ask that you would increase our confidence, not only in your ability to meet our needs, but in your willingness and graciousness to meet our needs. And so we bring them to you, empty vessels, that's all we are. Earthen vessels. We ask, O oh God, that you would make known your power in these earthen vessels. And that all the praise and all the glory and all the honor would be given to you now and evermore. We ask through Jesus.